Hello. Hello, everybody. Yo. Testing, testing. Hello, hello. Yo, 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 hello. yo, 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 oh, yo, yo, yo. Oh, my goodness. What did I? Oh, I probably messed up a bunch of different things. Mm, hey, hey, there we go. That's what I'm looking for. Hello, everybody. Hey, beautiful folks. Um, Wild Magic says, how come we don't have any weird things about Uh, There's a snake, isn't there? Yeah. We have a custom-made snake. Yeah, it's a custom-made snake. None of this off-the-shelf snakery for us. I custom-made it myself. Only... <laughs> hey, Andrew, how are you doing? Fantastic. Thank you very much. Good. It's always good when you're... When you're doing good, when you're doing good and you're feeling good. Man, I, uh... I might... Hmm, hmm. Hate hmm. to say it. Might need to start working out. Oh, you haven't that figured out a home fun. solution yet? We just called the 19 Club. With <laughs> on 19 pounds for the <laughs> Putting on the COVID-19? Putting on that, baby. It's like, uh, hey, man, if the new normal is staying at home, then the new normal can also be 19 pounds heavier <laughs> for everyone. Hey, look, if all it means is I got to frame my camera different, then let's roll. <laughs> hey, we'll know... Uh, <laughs> We'll know We're when you're in trouble, when you're, you're full Instagram girl looking straight up. Oh, yeah. Oh, the no, angle, I'm... yeah. <laughs> uh, all my selfies are just going to be of my eye. <laughs> oh, sure. The, the nice title, yeah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. We're going to start weird things here in just a moment. Everybody have a good weekend? Yeah. Do we still have the concept yeah. of weekends? By the yeah, way, I was about to say. <laughs> It is kind of funny how every day uh, is casual Friday. Um, I will definitely be low key eating soup during this show because, uh, based on my schedule, there's not a whole lot of uh, <laughs> not a whole lot of space for me to eat. Uh, oh yeah, going right from our stream, and then hopefully after this and after things, uh, Brian, uh, if if we wanted to. To go live for uh, the happy hour stream. Oh shit! I didn't think about starting that today. Um, uh, I mm. I might have to duck out for a scooch because uh, we normally set up for weird things between shows. Uh, you mean court killers or court killers? Yeah. Yeah. We Although I did get a little bit ahead of schedule. Um, I uh, I'll have to take care of emails. Um, yeah. how long were we thinking happy hour should go for? How long should an hour be? Uh I would suspect 60 minutes. Yeah. Okay. Um, shoot, let me see what time. Yeah, as long as I can get in here, you know, 30 minutes before Court Killer starts, I should be. Well, Josh had... Oh, that Josh. Yeah. That Josh. Mr. Mr. Reuben. Ugh. Um, Love Josh. Maybe we, maybe we could uh, uh, start a little bit early and then do our 60 minutes. Well, yeah, like, I think uh, he was saying pretty much right after after things. Yeah. Okay. All right. Then that'd work. Had some spaghetti. I made spaghetti last night. Uh, what's the recipe for that? Uh, ground pork. Use some use, use some ground pork. I've been I've been liking the ground pork lately over the ground beef. It's hard to find. Uh, a little bit spicier. Uh, well, uh, no, but it can be a little juicier, and it's kind of um, uh. Uh, and and you can I mean see you know spiciness is it comes with the seasoning you know. Well, that's weird. Am I am I seeing some kind of aliasing on my shirt? Uh, probably because it is so small. Oh yeah, no, I guess I don't normally sharp. notice that. It's just so sharply in focus. When was the last okay. time you guys had a good spaghetti? Uh, you know what? I stole some of my daughter's spaghetti uh like Ooh. a week or two ago. It was pretty good. Got her ass. What's that? Got her ass. <laughs> Andrew, what about you? On that sketty train? Um, I was just looking something up. What was it about spaghetti? I'm a fan. <laughs> spaghetti, <laughs> yes. Right. Yeah. But biscetti? Biscetti, yes. Yeah. Yeah, biscetti. Like <laughs> spaghetti. Buscetti, yeah. P Puscetti, yeah. You got you to gotta have it in the classic Italian style, Puscetti. Puscetti. Hey, ooh, wee. <laughs> What's funny is I bought like a bunch of, you know, uh, spaghetti sauce. I'm like, spaghetti's good, you know, and you're, couldn't find any noodles. And so that was sort of the uh, thing. Like, I, I was like on, 
Amazon like buying some crappy sort of macaroni shells and somebody bought them out from under me. I'm oh, like, no. ah! And then we went into the supermarket like last week when they were doing the stage thing. There was tons of noodles. So I had a happy ending. Yeah, I had um, um, I, I uh, normally when I make a I just make like a lunch meat sandwich, I'll have some chips, you know, sandwich and chips goes great together. Uh, the thing that I like to do is you can get these like vending machine packs of chips. So they're like already pre-portioned to like an ounce or an ounce and a half. And you just they're mm-hmm. always fresh because you rip them open every time. Uh, I ordered some off of Amazon, and they will arrive in like three weeks. <laughs> Holy cow! Yeah, yeah. that's uh, that's how it is. Out you know there. what's good is my girlfriend had this dish where it was like a tomato sauce, with like a little bit of salsa put in there, mm. and then you get a really thick multigrain bread and just dip it. Ooh, and that was really good. You that's know, it was like you so it's like a like a kind of a breadstick marinara with a bit of a salsa kick. Yeah, yeah, it was really good. Like really thick, like the really good multigrain bread. Like I'm like, it was pretty filling. I'm like, this is a neat, you know, quick to prepare because you just put those things, you know, in a bowl in a microwave and heat up the bread a little bit. And so I don't know where she got it, but that was a really good. Like you know, I never just had it like that. Hey, where are you at on trusting food that is prepared off site and delivered to you? Um, we wipe down the packaging. And so we wipe down all the packaging from that. So, you know, we, we still order out and do that. So what we do is anything that comes from outside the house is we, we take uh, either an alcohol spray or whatever, and we just wipe down the pack, the, the, the outside of that stuff. You know, the inside of it, um, uh, you know, if it's something that can be re-microwaved, are you going to heat it up? Then we microwave it, but we don't always do that. You know, and it's, it's you know, this, the data is, you know, if it goes into your stomach, you know, you're not, you're not really they apparently don't take medical advice here. Look this up independently, but yeah. you know, like the, the, they are saying like, but I've read several articles, like what happens to you? You're like, yeah, you're not really going to worry about it from there. It's more get You know, this gets the virus effects by getting into your lungs. So unless you're a really weird eater, yeah. and, you know, yeah. but again, you know, some stuff could be on the surface, stuff like that, but there's, uh, you know, they, they, they also part of the thing to talk about is viral load. You know, how much of a viral load can you get from something, even from like the, a package, you know? So, what we don't know, but like I, you know, I weigh that risk, and so yeah, I take I get food from outside, but again, we wipe down all the packaging, mm-hmm. particularly because if it's from the, I assume the kitchens are going to be pretty hygienic, but the delivery person is going to touch every doorknob and everything they can, you know, to from from where they are to your place, and if they're exposed to people, that's going to be your big vector. Yeah, I'm mainly opinion. worried about whether or not I could keep uh, going to Chick Fil A. Yeah, I think, you yeah, know, probably. that's the thing, too, is rep- reputational. Like, Chick-fil-A and places like In-N-Out are always been very clean, very, very hygienic, and they take that stuff seriously. Yeah, but all them kids, every time I pull up to that drive through there's like four to six of them all standing next to each other, chit-chatting less than three feet away from each other, breathing each other's wholesome high school germs on each other. But employees? There's yeah, that. yeah. All them kids. Yeah. They're all kids. They're <laughs> yeah, all children. They are, okay. As somebody should look into child labor laws. Uh, also, <laughs> disclosure, I definitely worked at Chick-fil-A. It was my first job because they were the only place that would hire a 15-year-old. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I worked for like a little uh, second-run movie theater, oh. and they paid me under the table. That was my first job. Uh, oh, yeah. No, I was a busboy at a pizza place where they definitely hired me at 15. And yeah. they paid me under the table. Yeah. I, uh, and I'm like, I think that was great. Like, I, for me, it was like you Oh, know, I loved 15. it. Yeah. You know, I've been clean toilets, do all that sort of stuff. But damn, you know, having a job at 15 and, you know, and working under the table, I thought was a great experience. I mean, to be honest, I I wanted a job at 14 because, you know what? I wanted to trade my time for money and nobody would let me. Yep. <laughs> and then finally, I think I was like a month before I turned 15 that I was already talking and applying at places. Yep. Interesting. Uh, Alamo just launched a uh, uh movie rental program huh and i'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that on courtkillers.com courtkillers today uh all right you guys ready to do weird things <laughs> uh yeah. yes okay then uh i will catch you guys in in three two hello and welcome to the weird things podcast i'm Adrian Main, joined by justin robert young hello mr brian brushwood yo ho yo ho and Bryce Castillo. The bottle of rum for me, please. 
Yeah, I am in my new uh, little office here, and I haven't hooked up my microphone yet, so I'm actually using my little AirPods here. But hmm. um, it's a different environment for me here. The yeah, acoustics are different. Yeah, yeah. So this, we'll be curious to see what happens during the summertime. Though I'm excited to see what happens. There's no AC in this office. Everything should be fine. Oof. Totally fine. I'll open that window. Does that mean that we are done with your old internet connection? This is the new shiny, amazing internet connection. Oh, you mean my uh, fiber optic connection? Yes, this is what we're on right now. Fancy. Oh, God damn. Yeah, uh, yeah uh, two, two, so. two, two expenses in your future. One, a $99 window unit from uh, Amazon. Number two, uh, a short throw cardioid microphone that will not hear the blaringly loud sound of the $99 AC unit on the window. <laughs> this, this is the advantage of working with guys who've been doing this for years is, you know, that because I was looking at a window unit, but I'm like, yeah, I don't know if we'll be able to run it, you know, one doing but yeah, no, the, uh, uh, yeah. Th this, uh, I mean, these are more expensive. This is a high LPR 40, but if you get a good cardioid mic, I mean, we, keep in mind for years and years, we would go to the loudest freaking bars and shoot scam school episodes. And it was astonishing how even beyond the crowd noise would be like the copyrighted music. We were able to have low enough and, you know, it wasn't ideal, uh, from a production standpoint, but, uh, functional. I mean, we were able to, to, it, it's, it's astonishing what a good short throw Michael do. Yeah, no, that's very, very helpful. So I'll look into doing that. I have, um... hold on, hold on. What kind of entertainer would be in the need of any kind of home broadcasting? I mean, like, like who would possibly need to learn such lessons uh, aside from every radio station and television station that produces live content aside from them name me one person who would need to learn these lessons Brian. also late night hosts and uh yeah uh, also President literally Harris. everyone <laughs> uh, oh as a matter of fact uh, i'm starting to hear podcasts uh treated as a novel thing to podcast from home uh, as a matter of fact the reply all podcasts were like this is so crazy i'm in my attic he's in his office we're both at home it's wacky uh Welcome to the club, people. Really <laughs> yeah, but see the numbers and say podcasting has uh, listening has gone down. Well, I mean, I don't know how accurate that is, but I saw the report. <laughs> yeah, because everybody's actually... too busy making their own podcasts. Well, no one's driving. <laughs> Less people are driving. Most people, you know, drive yeah. or listen while they drive. I mean, you might, might be a big packer for it, you know. Um, and yeah, and I think I rarely listen to podcasts in the home. There's something I do when I leave the house. Yep. You know, so uh, uh, we'll see. Uh, I have, I have, I think I, oh, it looks to be pretty good news. And man, you know, we talked about Strata launch a while ago. That was Paul Allen, one of the Microsoft founders. He was a big space enthusiast. Uh, and you had three Strata guys. launch was the one that had the crazy, like double. It was like, it was like two seven four fifty sevens in tandem, holding hands, carrying a rocket with yeah. them. That's the one. Like, yeah, Paul Allen, there were, of the three people who are putting in a ton of money, of uh, the you know billionaires putting money into space, was Paul Allen, Elon Musk, and Jeff Bezos. When the sadly, the untimely passing of Paul Paul Allen was, you know, looked like things were in dire straits there for Strata Launch, but they were able to get a backer, and they are now back in business, and they just announced that they are putting together an a, you know a new fleet of stuff, and yeah, utilizing. They have this humongous airplane, this huge airplane that's actually capable. There were designs back in the day when they were talking about working with, with SpaceX of like actually strapping a Falcon 9, you know, underneath that thing and dropping it. Um, and then I think they parted ways for probably multiple reasons, but they've announced their own line of spacecraft. And you can see if you go to the Strata launch page, part of what they're working on is like hypersonic craft, like things that go just ridiculously fast. Including, they formally announced that they do plan on building. There is the the Black Ice, which is their fully reusable space plane, which would be a basically a craft that would you know probably have a booster stage too, but then would drop from the Strata launch vehicle and then reach orbit. Wait, so, oh, um, kind oh, of wow. Okay, stuff. okay. So the, I I hadn't really thought of Strata launch as being a contender uh, for um for hyperfast global travel. But I guess I guess that totally makes sense. Like um, we were talking about, uh, uh, you know, the BFR being able to essentially in 30 minutes get you from, you know, Seattle to Hong Kong or whatever. But maybe instead of 30 minutes, this is a 90 minute journey 
and and you know your your conventional craft up until the top of the atmosphere, and then you you go for a roller coaster ride, and then you're there in an hour and a half. I, I uh, have they announced any plans for like commuter purposes for for within the Earth? Nothing along those lines yet. They're they're talking right now more for research, the ability to use this stuff for like research. You know, hypersonic platform has a lot of utility for military research, et cetera. And that would probably be who, because they're looking at, you know, Mach 6, okay? Um, so you're looking at, you know, the military applications like that. And I'm certainly, you know, I'm sure down the line there are some thoughts of like, oh, if we can make this more widespread, what have you, that, yeah, yeah. it would be cool if I, we could do that. I, I think right now anybody who's in this space is looking at, they're running the playbook that SpaceX has run, right? And that's primarily build your, uh, build your equipment, have your business be uh, feeding the gigantic amount of money that is coming from space and pr or government and private industry to access space. On top of yeah. that, the platform is yours to build whatever you want on. Yeah, if you click on the link for the Talon A, you can see where they're talking about like the applications, data services, uh, instrumentation and experiments, things like this. So if you want a way to sort of test this sort of stuff, um, you know, very interesting. A lot of it probably is code for some of the sort of military applications too. Yeah. So I'm just reading some of the, uh... Yeah. I mean, that's, that's where the money is, right? That, that's, that's how you make this kind of stuff worth it a lot faster. Um, and then once you've proven your track record and in terms of, uh, you know, the, the engineering and, and you understand what your costs are each time you're going up on a more realistic, uh, uh, realistic way, then I think that there's a lot that you can build on. But I would so much rather see this and then two years in, three years in, let them make their money, let them interact with the government, let private industry be the one that's taking a lot of risks. And then, you know, we, we think about getting from New York to Hong Kong in, in 45 minutes. Like, uh, so they, um, that'd be good. They, they talk about the Strata Launch Carrier, which is the largest airplane in the world. Uh, this would be able to launch three of these at a time. Wow. So kind of a, a, a neat concept. So and, and what kind you know, of payload would each one have? Um, I think vehicle weighs like 6,000 pounds. As far as what kind of payload they'd have, I don't know what this version. And this is, you know, this is sort of their, their test bed sort of craft. And then I think part of what they want to do is you work on this, you use this, you figure out your systems, then figure out how to scale up from there to whatever you want to do. And, and that's, you know, you, what we saw what SpaceX did, which was very smart, and it, you know what uh, Blue Origin does to their own is, you start with a smaller scale thing. You know, SpaceX said, okay, we want to build an engine, so we're going to build a single engine rocket. You know, which will build the Falcon One. And once we know that engine works, then we can build a bigger cylinder, put more engines there. Blue Origin, same thing with their engines and what they worked on, but they started just doing suborbital, you know, flights with with new. But you build a thing, you get that first stage to work, rather than say, oh. There are some companies that are like, oh yeah, no, we're gonna from the get go, we're gonna try and build ourselves a fully, you know, a, you know, a reusable space plane or whatever. And it's like, uh, nations failed at that. That's yeah. hard. Yeah. Build that incremental step. You know, solve that small hard that the problem. You think that like, yeah, we think we got this problem. Like, well, solve that. Find an application for it, which I think is clever. Like, yeah, we think we can do this. But if we can get customers for it, then we can get money to keep doing it. Then we can build that next thing and eventually work our way up to. You know, a space plane, which would be amazing because that would be, I think, a fully reusable system, which would be nice to have an alternative. Uh, you know, we're excited. We're Blue Origin's going and SpaceX's going. But, yeah, let's have alternatives. So oh, uh, sure, yeah. Because uh, you, want, you want that price to come down. And, 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 and more so, uh, when we talk about di you know, ideas having DNA, right, like this is part of it in real time. Like you are seeing – Progress comes when you learn from the people that have successfully done stuff before and then go forward. Do, do we know anything about the money that was invested in this, who, where it came from or what they're into, what they're like? Are they cool? Um, I don't know. I, I was trying to figure out who that is right now, who put investment into that. I yeah. don't know if they went and got multiple factors. percent but... stake from coronavirus <laughs> covid <laughs> No! Space News says uh, uh, transitioned ownership from Vulcan, uh, which was Alan's company, to an unnamed organization that has been found out to be Cerberus Capital Management, a private equity fund. Oh, okay. I, I have heard of, of that, that company before. Uh, that's, that's money. That's they, money wanting to make more money. They guard the gates of hell, I believe. Yes.
Yes. A three-headed operation. If you play the music, they go to sleep. Uh, so I'm, I'm very excited about that. I'm just so glad to have because I was like, think, I was like, man, straddle. Yeah, yeah, it was a bummer because like you want as um, <laughs> in the in the uh, was it around the world in so many days? Like you want as or the Cannonball Run, you want as many different wacky ideas being tried at once. You know, it's like the the reusable rocket, the single stage to orbit, the airplane that carries a, a, a little space shuttle and flings it up there. Yep. Uh, I'll give you another cool space news thing. I got actually got a couple, several stories here. Is there's a company called Link L Y N K, and they did an experiment uh, about a couple weeks ago, which was really cool. And it's cool if you appreciate how cell phones work and what they do and what they don't know. Cell phones, you know, I think most people know is they're called cell phones because they have antennas that are nearby. You know, the idea was let's let's break up instead of having big huge transmitters, let's have smaller phones, but let's put smaller, you know, less expensive transmitters. You know, every thousand meters or something just break a thing into a bunch of small little zones so your cell phone goes from little cell block to cell block to cell block right mm -hmm. and the advantage of that is like i said cell phones can be extremely small you can hold a phone in your hand because it doesn't have to send that signal terribly far well link was thinking like what if could you communicate to a cell phone a regular cell phone not a satellite phone but a regular functional just like an iphone from space by using a specifically sort of targeted signal using multiple satellites that account for like the Doppler shift and the signal being sent down, et cetera. And they actually were able to do this. They had a satellite and they were able to run an experiment where they were able to send a signal. They had somebody to the Falkland Islands, not known for good cell phone signal. And they were able to send like a text message alert to a person there, to a group there on the ground there using a satellite. And wow. they say they'd actually be able to send text messages back up. And this might be a thing where, you know, it might be doing things with your regular cell phone antenna, like trying to stretch out, you know, the signal or how it does or repeating things like this. There's a lot of probably cleverness that goes in there. But, yes, this is a cool thing. They're now able to send text messages, like very simple data signals to conventional. Again, there's no special antenna. There's nothing that's on here other than just software. They can take a regular iPhone or Android device put their software on it and it's capable of getting information from space. I guess that makes sense because when it comes to radio transmissions, we learned a little bit of this when we learned about ham radios and stuff on the modern rogue, like you either need exquisitely sharp ears. Let's say the satellite, you know, has a giant, for example, like uh, think of the, 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 the Arecibo radio telescope. It's just a giant dish. That's a very big ear. That's able to listen for radio signals from space. So even though they're extraordinarily faint, the ear is so big, it's able to listen. And then likewise to transmit from the satellite, you just need to be loud enough. You got to have enough power to blast it down that, that the weak uh, receiver is able to hear it. And so it sounds like by using multiple satellites, and this is only going to get more powerful with the Starlink sat uh, satellite array going out, then then you're, you're able to sort of create a virtual giant parabolic uh, big, big ear to listen for very faint signals. Well, I mean, the Starlink would be it's a very different tech, very different bandwidth, what have you. I mean, this, this... What, what I mean, what I mean is as the entire sky becomes covered in a grid, then mm -hmm. it becomes easier to have not just one satellite listening for a transmission, but arrays of them aggregating that signal and putting it together. Yeah, you would certainly. Yeah, there absolutely. I think that more satellites would increase the sort of throughput. I think there's going to be some pretty it's it's going to be really hard at a certain point beyond that, because the way you're the, the, you're still going to get a lot of noisiness the more things you have in an area so you're probably going to be limited to the kind of data you can do because it's going to be you're still going to be trying to pick up one conversation in a stadium um sort of thing and well, so it'll be wait, I, that, I, that's I, actually a really good example because that's quite literally what they do with those parabolic microphones during uh nfl games is they they literally overhear a single conversation in the middle of a huge stadium well, yeah, yeah, but they're trying to do it on the field where there's fewer players that are they're isolated from other people. But if you have like 12 people together, it gets harder. But yeah, and that's that's the – and it is a good example saying it's good for here when they're a little bit spread out. You can pick it up from far away. But when a group of people are together, you're going to get a lot of crosstalk. But, um, you know, we'll see. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I can only speculate as to what, you know, what beyond what's in the, you know, the, the conventional news article. But it's exciting. I mean, the idea that you could have emergency responders and people like this – to say like, hey, yeah, no, when you're in the middle of, you know, when I was, you know, doing a Shark Week thing in the middle of the ocean, I'm out, I'm out, 
you know, halfway in Antarctica. And, you know, I have to use, uh, you know, thankfully, Motorola let me borrow one of their satellite phones, which is useful. But, you know, for a regular person, able to take your regular phone out and do that. Awesome. That's that's a that's a game changer. And, and it's it. those are the things that I like the best because it brings the tech more to a a tangible reality if you don't need your own hardware. Yeah, I could see, you know, uh, they're going to do an experiment where they have another like small satellite. They're going to launch from the International Space Station. Apparently, it's already up there. They can do that. Um, and we've looked at how, you know, Facebook and some of these other companies have been looking for ways like how do you connect people the last mile? And this isn't going to be good for video and that. But, uh, you know, they have that that low bandwidth version of Facebook that they use in uh, lesser developed countries, because just the ability for somebody who's, you know, let's say, you know, you live in you know, equatorial Africa or whatever, you want to be able to participate in markets. You want to be able to participate in your economy. And if you're remote, it's hard to do that. But we've seen how transformed with cell phones have been for that and to give people those opportunities there and first responders and other places. Ah, it's exciting. So maybe I can uh, use this build podcast else? to do. You want to know what else is exciting? The folks who keep this show running. Guys, Hi, it's me, Justin Robert Young. I do the Weird Things podcast with two of my best friends in the whole wide world. And we really love doing it. Boy, howdy. And we, th we, we do it because people listen. And the, and, and the best people who listen also give us money at patreon.com slash weird things. Not only do you get the episode early, you get the after things show early. Uh, you get it on your own custom RSS feed. It's so easy. You put it into the podcatcher, your choice, and it just fills our hearts. Uh, 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 look, f uh, folks, we love you. Patreon.com slash weird. <laughs> there, we said it. Uh, you don't have to say it back, but you could just, you know, slip us a, an old George Washington if you love us back. Exactly. Or Franklin. <laughs> yeah, why not? Hey, our Harriet Tubman, you know, we're not picky. <laughs> exactly. Do what you yeah. need. Patreon. Not yet, but they should be. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so this is a cool story. This was actually uh, in the hopper, but also tweeted at us. Um, man, like I, I admire the spirit of trying to solve problems and get things done. And, uh, um, and oh man, this, like, man, this, man, this sounds like a setup for damning with faint praise. <laughs> I admit, no, I admire no. the spirit of trying. Dot dot dot. <laughs> uh, so. Dr. Daniel Reardon, a research fellow at Melbourne University, is concerned, like, as I say this, I did the very thing we're not supposed to do, and Justin just did the thing, too. Touching your face. Oh. We're not supposed to touch our face. Oh, my gosh. I, and he's uh, like... Uh, for, the, for the record, it has been a chronic thing. For anybody who's been watching any of the live streams, you know, I had a cold three weeks ago, and since then, uh, it's taken a very long time to get everything all fully cleared up, but my eustachian tube is still swollen and I don't want to go to the doctor because I don't want to be around, you know, sick people, especially since everything online says you just got to wait and it'll be fine. But I have been like, I'm on a plane constantly equally like, like you can actually, man, I, part of me wants to stick a microphone in there so you can hear it squeaking just, uh, immediately my right ear goes deaf. I, I probably touch my face twice a minute, every minute, all day, every day. And that's not great. Yeah, just hearing you mention touching your face, I'm resisting every effort in the world to try to touch my face. <laughs> so uh, Dr. Reardon wanted to work on this solution, wanted to come, had, a, had a solution for this, and he thought, well, what if you built a system or something that warned you when you brought your hands near your face? Now, I found wearing gloves is super helpful because you're very aware when you're touching gloves to your face, and so if I'm out in public, I'm always wearing gloves, which is you're like, oh, no, I'm not going to touch that, but – he, he apparently tried some different things. He tried like an antenna around the neck for the problem off. It was always going off. And uh, his defense is like, you know, I'm you know, an astrophysicist. I work with these really huge waves. This is a different area of physics for me. And then he, then he apparently decided that, well, what if I built something much more simple? Like you could, do, you could use a magnetometer. There's very simple little things like reed switches, which in, they can open or close in the presence of a magnetic field. And I assume that's maybe something he worked on. He thought, what if I put magnets in my nose? What? And then when I bring my hands, like I have a device to detect it. Now, apparently, uh, 
the problem was he decided to put one magnum and again a mistake i could see myself making i'm not criticizing he put one magnet in one nostril and said well two's better than one and he put the other magnet oh in the no other nostril. here's the thing many people may not know about magnets they stick together <laughs> yeah. and so he basically had two magnets stuck to each other inside of his nasal passage and had to go to the doctors to have them removed. Oh. Um, uh, you know, um, thank you, doctor. I appreciate, I'm, I'm, listen, I want more experiments, more people trying stuff. If every now and then you got to go to the hospital to have a magnet removed from your nose, if it leads to some development that helps people, it's worth it. All uh. right, number one, number one, everybody who always goes out on Twitter, believe scientists. Why don't we pay attention to science? <laughs> science? Look, I'm on this guy's side. Sometimes science is ugly. Sometimes science is stupid. Sometimes science with your best intentions lead you to do something where you where you don't realize that you're you're doing something that that eventually is you're, you're so far deep into the forest you can't see the trees and you have to go to the ER because you got magnets stuck in your nose. Also, this is what science looks like. Uh, also, uh, this this is what a hero looks like. I mean, in an alternate reality, this dude came up with a system that saved the whole world. Speaking of which, I wonder if. But also, the, just just for the record, this guy admits that he has no expertise with building circuits, and the device that he created only works unless you move your hand close to your face. They so said the same thing about about Ford and and uh, uh, Edison and, and <laughs> bicycle mechanics, a couple of bicycle mechanics yeah. in Ohio. They're that's right. Yeah, 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 that's right. They built a little thing called uh, uh, space. No, uh, airplanes. <laughs> uh, but y you know what it makes me think of? Do you remember we talked about this device a while ago? The Pavlok P A V L O K. Uh, yes. Th this guy uh, created a device that you could program on your smartphone that that would that would deliver a mild shock. That seems like that would be super easy to reprogram this br bracelet to you know when it senses you you train it on what it looks like when your hands move to your face and then it just gives you a little tweak and says, "Hey buddy, knock that off." Yeah. If he had been into machine learning, he would have come about this in a very different way. And you certainly could. We've seen with the Apple Watch how you can train the thing to, to, to tell the difference between an intentional fall and an unintentional fall. And if you had two on each, you know, one on each wrist, which we would like to have a lesser, you know, sophisticated way to solve this problem. But we, we have been very good at that since the guy touching his face right now. Um, but, yeah, you could probably you could train that. Like you just said, you could probably a device like that. It very easily train it, and like I think you could do. I think it's a solvable thing through tech. It's just you. You know what? It worth it? Even as you were talking, I realized that by virtue of wearing glasses, it becomes a natural thing every minute or two to just push it up on the bridge of my nose, which makes it even less likely that I could get away without touching my face. Yeah. Uh, so. <laughs> I mean, like, can I can I ask a question that might be I might be as dumb as the dude who shoved magnets up his nose, but like, uh, not dumb. I'm not again. I'm, I'm not. I, no, 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 I'm that, I'm not saying he meant that brave. He's dumb. He meant brave. He might be as brave as that guy. I be as brave by asking a question that might reveal myself to be stupid. If all you're doing is sitting at home and washing your hands, I mean, a face touch here and again, yeah, like it's not. So yes, but. Uh, the, the, I think part of it is just to, you want to break the habit and the idea that if you're conscious of it when you're at home, then when you're yeah. out in public, you'll be even more sense. conscious of it. Yeah, but yeah, you're right. Like, yeah, I, I same thing. Like, it's me and my girlfriend, we had we had a repairman come in and fix a drawer, and the first thing we do after we left, like, oh, thanks, locked the door, disinfected everything that he touched, everything he was near, you know, because we're just trying to be that super cautious. So I would expect that it's just our germs in here, um, but again breaking that habit uh actually, Did, have what's that uh, i was gonna uh, ask if one week ago i had discovered that website that i forwarded over to justin that uh that healthdata.org site did we talk about this last time um the, uh, apparently, according to a Reddit post, this is help financed by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, but it's COVID19.healthdata.org. And uh, I found it really surprisingly comforting in that it, on a state-by-state -state basis, it takes the latest uh, data day by day 
and um, it knows how many hospital beds are available in the general populace. It knows how many are available in the ICU on a state-by-state basis, and it makes a projection for each state of when it's going to hit peak resource usage. It does make some assumptions, like the fact that it assumes we're going to keep on doing social distancing the way we are right now, but it gives sort of a tangible timeline that is somewhat comforting in that you can at least see a light at the end of the tunnel. It's a bummer that that light is on the other side of a mountain where things are going to get busier and busier. But for example, here in Texas, um, oh, wow, this is wild because the peak resource use was April 19th, but now it's pushed back and it says that peak resource use in Texas will be on May 2nd. So my guess is uh, that could be an indication of, of the curve actually flattening, but it looks like even at peak resource use, as of now, the estimates are that there'll be more beds than people, um, maybe less so for the ICU side of things. What's the what's the URL for that again? Uh, Just- it's covid19.healthdata.org, O-R-G. And, and uh, for those who watched the press conference in the Rose Garden uh, yesterday, there was a lot of discussion by Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks of the Murphy model. Um, if this is not the Murphy model, then this seems to track similarly with, with what they were talking about. I wasn't able to find if this is the exact same model, but it, it is one of the models that I know they were looking at. Apparently, there's 12 uh, going around, but this actually has the death toll on the lower end of 100,000, which was the number that got floated, not only by Dr. Fauci in the press, but also during uh, the press conference yesterday. Yeah, and and for a moment too, I think what's interesting what they talked about too was that uh, they split into two groups, basically. There was another group that was also doing their modeling to try to figure out what they thought the ideal time was and where this was. And then when they met and they said, yeah, we, we came to this conclusion, like, yes, we had the same conclusion. And, you know, it was a very interesting thing, a very interesting approach. Like how if you're looking for something to read, um, uh, a great book is in a book that I, I say this before. The problem with this book is often people give you the thought that sort of the cliff notes version, which is actually almost 180 degrees opposite of what the book really talks about. And that's the uh, the wisdom of crowds uh, by uh, James Sirwicky. And it gets into. The idea that if you want to find kind of if you want something, if you want to get information about something, one is you you can pool a large group of people and then put that data together and look for averages with sometimes what will happen is the wild guesses on either side will sort of cancel each other out and the more reasoned ones will sort of agree and reinforce. But the problem happens is if somebody says, "Okay, we'll go into a room and we'll ask 30 people and let them debate and then have a vote. And that's the opposite approach, because what will happen there is the most persuasive person there. We'll get everybody on board to their opinion, and then we lose all the outlier and the other stuff that can reinforce it. And that was one of the most critical things about the book is you'd be like, oh, yeah, ask a bunch of experts, pull their opinions together. It's like in isolation, independent, have people independently yeah. come to those conclusions because you've been in a room where like, oh, I think this. Like, no, nah, we'll talk to you. They talk a person out of a point of view, and then later on you find out like, no, we would have been maybe more close for that. So here one of the first steps they talked about doing was sort of like kind of let's, let's start – over and look at the models and figure out what we need to do here. Let's look at multiple models. Meanwhile, in another group, another group apparently was doing a similar thing. And then they met and they're like, wow, okay, our answers converge, which, you know, is a, a very healthy way to try to figure out, you know, what you want to do. So, yeah. Uh, also, just a real quick follow up. So, uh, uh, this indeed, the, the website that, that Brian just gave is uh, uh, by uh, Christopher J.L. Murray, the professor and director of the uh, uh, IHME, which put this together. So this is the model, the Murray model that, not Murphy, uh, the Murray model that uh, that they were discussing. And, uh, uh, you know, obviously this is being used to, to help guide some of our public policy, and uh, it is certainly worth looking at. And although there are some grim elements here, including, you know, days ahead where we, we might lose over 2,000 Americans in a day for, for close to a week, uh, at the very least, it does have glimmers of hope, like population centers in California, Texas, Illinois, and Florida staying under uh, the most catastrophic scenarios, which right yeah. now seem to be playing out in New York and uh, Michigan and Louisiana specifically. Yeah, then it's it's a it's you know, grim grim sort of scenarios and stuff, and I think and it is. 
it is helpful to sort of look too at other places around the world, other Western countries, and how they're trying to face this too. And you know, we we you know what's the right response? Whatever you know, hard to know. But you look at other places that are dealing with this challenge too, and it's there are no easy answers. There are no easy answers. Um, no, as it turns out, it's a global pandemic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, traditionally, not something that everybody. Uh, I mean, th th there's a a highly realistic, if not extraordinarily probable scenario where we come out of this and we have survived this global pandemic worldwide better than any such <laughs> in history. Right. And, and we look back and say, Hey, look, what a, what a, what a great way we survived something like this. Uh, but you know, uh, all we can do is stay safe now and, and try to follow uh, the guidance that we have. Yeah, one of the uh, one of the potential casualties of this is the company OneWeb, which when we're talking about building satellite constellations around the Earth, OneWeb was one of the earliest ones out there. I think the first ones to put up a large group of satellites. There are competitions with SpaceX, Starlink, and they had launched a number of launches, but then they were looking to do another funding round and try to continue on. But apparently that they have filed for bankruptcy, citing COVID-19 as a factor for that. Wow. Oh. Um, whether or not that was oh. ultimately, I, you know, but I have a, I hesitate to call it a good thing, but, um, uh, I have, I have a COVID weird things story. Did you guys see like directly attributable to the fact that everybody was hunkered down for COVID-19, uh, almost certainly saved multiple lives when a massive, uh, tornado touched down live during the news. Uh, I think this was two days ago in Arkansas, did you guys see this footage? They, no. they, they're, they're given the weather report. Uh, the local weatherman is like, hey, they're downgrading and they're calling off this tornado weather warning. Uh, looking at the data, I think they shouldn't have done that. I say be really careful. And they've got, you know, most local news stations have their local camera just poking out a, a, a window. And uh, sure enough, you watch live as it forms a funnel cloud and then touches down and it just becomes super massive, ripping up. Debris whip, uh, whipping it all around. Apparently went through a mall, destroyed the whole thing, but nobody was there because they were all hunkered down for COVID-19. They only had five serious uh, injuries. Uh, it's it's remarkable watching. I don't know if Price is able to find it or not. Uh, I can't find that footage. It looks like maybe the injury counter is up to 22, but I don't see any information about deaths. So. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I, the story I'd heard was that there weren't any deaths. Um, let me see wow. if I can find that uh, that video footage because it's it's fairly remarkable. Yeah, that's the that is the other side of it is because when you're not able to go about your normal activities, you know the harm reduction from that. And uh, you know, but the other side of it though is you know there are people who are needing medical attention or elective stuff, and it's you know you're you're thinking second you know, guessing yourself and being able to do that. So, but yeah, certainly a situation here like holy cow, we're looking at a tornado uh, ripping through a town. And mm -hmm. uh, wow, it looked like it just hit some like electrical junction box or something. You got a bunch of sparks and things. Yeah. Um, the uh, oh, doggone it. It looks like, uh, let's see. To, I guess I'll search tornado live news and see if that pops up for the last week. It could also be this footage that we're looking at here. I'm... Uh, no, it's a. Uh, uh, it was. It was definitely like like the weatherman is standing in front of the tornado the whole time, and it's like he he gets asked to step off screen for a little bit, and then he steps back on so he can point to different <laughs> various things. Uh, yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah. Uh, uh, maybe it's KCTV five would be the one. Oh nope, that's ten months ago. Never mind. Forget I said that. I'm only making it worse. <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah, it's it's amazing. You, yeah, if you worked at like you know the hot dog stand at that mall and you're at home and you watch this happen, you're like you're thinking like, man, God loves me. <laughs> yeah, but not everybody else. It is it is pretty wild too because of the vantage point when you're in, on the highway, you can't really because of the buildings, you can't see the way the camera on the top of this building could so you're just watching this thing go towards the highway and just all of these cars heading right towards it and then there is a brief moment that it crosses over a public street you start seeing some pretty sharp u-turns <laughs> as people are clearly driving right yeah. towards this massive like f4 <laughs> somebody's got like got my gloves on got my mask you know i wiped everything out and disinfected it. now let me go get some milk yeah right <laughs> Honey, what happened? Um, where's the coffee? <laughs> Not happening today. Uh, gentlemen, you want to do picks? 
I got to pick. I don't know if I like or hate this show. I don't know if the show likes or hates its protagonists, but I've started watching The Crown on Netflix. Huh. And uh, uh, if you liked Downton Abbey and you liked House of Cards, but you want it to be a version of uh, a, you know reality that's actually happened, uh, specifically the ascension of Queen Elizabeth, uh, who is still Queen of England, uh, then, then I would recommend it. The first episode was a little slow, but uh, uh, essentially it gets into kind of a... Uh, uh, each episode is sort of a slice of life of like, you know, 24 to 72 hours of a crisis that happened, uh, you know, for the queen or the government. And, um, you know, there's, uh, uh, there's just moments when I'm watching it and I'm like, is the most like powerful person who got to be powerful by birthright? <laughs> like, is this the most sympathetic protagonist? Like, even when they have the problems, it's like, oh, okay, all right. But I, again, I, I'm enjoying it, and and there are moments where I very much enjoy it, and there are moments where I'm like, okay, uh, I I don't know how much I care about these particular. Uh, problems, but John Lithgow plays uh, Winston Churchill, and that's worth the price of admission. Oh hell's yeah! Uh, hey, uh, somebody did find in the chat. The Reverend Puck found it. If you search for Toronto, or sorry, Jonesboro tornado on live TV, it's K A I T TV coverage it. from a couple days ago. I'm giving it for the audio people, but thanks. Uh, and then, uh, but uh, my uh, my pick is Half Life. Alex, it's good. If you have a VR, if you've been waiting for that AAA. Awesome, massive multi-hour experience. If you've been looking for a game that's more than a party demo, then uh, man, oh man, you cannot do better than Half-Life Alex. It is fantastic, engaging. Took me uh, the better part of three, three and a half days um, uh, to finish, uh, give or take. Uh, I think I think total play time was maybe 16, 17 hours. Um, I took my time because it was so tasty and delicious. Uh, I, I loved it. It's it's the defining VR experience. It is heavy on the suspenseful, kind of zombie-like, high-tension stuff. And those moments can be a little bit frustrating when you perceive that it's not so much your lack of skill, so much as a lack of tracking on the controllers or something that's causing you to not be able to get things done. Uh, but it, uh, it's fantastic. It's uh, super, super great. Oh, uh, uh, sorry, I'm doing... Andrew, can you go? Because I'm not ready to give a pick. Oh, yeah, sure, man, no worries. Um, I have a pick. It's an obscure thing, and I think that once people pay attention to it, it'll get a little bit of attention, maybe. Uh, it's called a uh, Netflix documentary called The Tiger King. Oh, baby! Number one uh, show in America, apparently. Like, by the numbers. Yeah, it's the show we need right now. It's the show we need right now. Um, I... I, I'm gonna. I don't want to. No spoilers, or whatever. Although everything is sort of set up right at the beginning. Um, I'm gonna say that it's amazing when you watch something, and as far as you know, you feel it's. I don't. You know, I assume that's accurately portrayed. Who knows? I mean, the documentaries. The problem is, is every time I walk out of a documentary, I go like, okay, I watched some footage and I watched a thing. And I think this is what they want me to think. And I think this is probably what happened. But, you know, the shortcuts, and you know, the stuff and documentarians are the most prejudicial of any kind of filmmaker there is. You know, they're the ones that clear because you because you're willing to spend three years or four years of your life putting something together. You do it because you have a point of view on something. Um, and so that's always when I'm mindful whenever I watch something like don't believe what I like walk out of there and look for the contrary opinions, whatever, because you're going to find out it's often more complicated, whatever. But assuming. You know, and, and nothing I saw on Wikipedia sort of contradicted it, whatever. You watch a thing and you kind of walk away going, the person you know who did stuff wrong, like really, really, really wrong, um, you know, the evidence is very overwhelming they did something wrong versus the person who maybe did something wrong in the past, but we don't really kind of know, but was ultimately basically about them trying to do something right. You're more sympathetic to the person who did something really, really wrong because they're so charismatic. You know, and you're like, ah, 
I, 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 you know, it's like an HBO show, you know, where like you're, you know, the, the, the anti-hero where you're like, man, this person's amazing. <laughs> and like, ah, yeah, maybe they did these horrible things, but ah, you know, so. Yeah. Uh, I thought, very well done. We, we rewatched the first two episodes on Saturday because we were talking to a friend of ours who uh, she is like a massive animal lover. Like she is literally uh, stopped on the side of the road because there was a three legged bunny that she in her apartment now lives with. She, she took in a disabled bunny that she saw that on the bunny. side. That's how much she loves animals. And we were like, you gotta watch it. The, 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 the tiger stuff is, it's a part of it, but it's not the point of it. Like it gets far beyond, uh, uh, you know, this, this tiger dispute. And, uh, so she sat down and watched the first two episodes, but man, that turn in the last five minutes of the, of, of the second episode, that then is the entirety of the third episode. Just one of the, the most like hairpin wild turns I have ever seen in a documentary and beyond that, no. To, to go to your preamble, Andrew, the thing that I did like about the doc is that a lot of the crazy stuff it's just set on camera. Like so, like yeah. yes, you can you can presume that there are uh, uh, things that are shaved to make sure that the message kind of gets across. But you know, I was joking on the stream the other day that a lot of times, if you have a condition somewhere that you are talking to the people involved in it and you want to get them to say it document like documentaries tend to have these tricks. Right. And one of the tricks are like, you'll have, if some, let, let's say somebody's like in like a cult like situation, you'll have people describe what they're doing. Right. And then you'll like cut to somebody else saying, well, the, 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 a cult, like a, an FBI guy say, well, a cult is defined by all these things. And you'll just put those things next to each other. Not the case with this documentary. Like you just have people out and out saying like, well, I got my cult. He's got his cult. You know, we're just kind of cult leaders, I guess. Like I prefer the way I'm running it. Like there's, there's just so, so, so much where uh, the, the, the words just kind of tumble out. These characters are so, visceral that they just i think that combined between the three of them joe exotic carol baskin and doc antle blink like a combined seven times <laughs> like they are yeah. all just like have these kind of like wide but when they do blink they're like doozies it's like you're like oh my god this is there's something going on uh yeah and then uh tim stark who anybody who gets to do an interview and just having a monkey casually hang around his neck all the time you see this guy working you know uh, a ditch digger and there's this <laughs> monkey just hanging out around i'm like how how did i miss this job i didn't know that was on there it was an application for that so oh. i uh with the popularity of tiger king i've encountered uh, a surprising phenomenon to me because i was hooked I've, i gobbled this thing up in like two days it was insane but now i'm encountering people who cannot bring themselves to even get past the second episode. Like, uh, Bonnie tried. Like, she genuinely tried and just hated everything about every second of the first episode and and every clip she's seen. She doesn't like a single moment of any of it. Spoiler alert coming up for Cord Killers. Tom was not able to uh, get close to finishing it. He rage quit in the second episode because he just hated every second of it. Uh, I, 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 I think that's, that's, I mean, it's a legitimate position too, because there's a lot of ugliness in there. I don't, I don't blame, I mean, that's kind of the whole disaster that we're watching is all of the ugliness. Yeah. I mean, we spoiler territory. What is, is, I mean, it's mild. Is it that we, the turn that one of the characters we realize about their past that's throwing people or. I mean, it's all, they start doling that out. It's the second episode. They talk about, uh, uh what's his name? Doc. And Antol, 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 yeah. Antol, yeah. They, uh, that's where they start talking about the structure of his organization, right? Yes. And then, uh, and then it just gets uglier from there. I, I, I don't know if we're just gawking or just constantly surprised. I mean, it's a bit. I, I kind of hate myself. It's, it's a bit like the beginning uh, parts of an American Idol season, 
where oh know, yeah it's all it's all messy drama i mean what is a cool theme of the show is they all hate each other and the only reason they like pretend to protect each other is because they are all guilty of the same crimes full stop literal crimes yeah, yeah. like yeah. they they yeah. the only reason that they have any good <laughs> things to say about each other is because if one goes down then they will take all of them down yeah it's it's a trade that like that the wild animal life animal you know like trade is a thing that you get people who for years get away with doing things that were and then you just sort of get conditioned to the idea, well, it's okay because nobody's getting in trouble. Then all of a sudden you get in trouble. I'm like, wait, what? And then everything sort of falls apart. But uh, yeah, I, I'm i surprised. Like, I don't, I mean, we have to talk maybe when we can get into spoilers about why I can't imagine why somebody would stop after that second episode because it's where you just, you get into this sort of insight of this, this these personalities. And, you know, well, I, 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 think, other... I think Bonnie's take, and I don't think I'm, talking out of school speaking for her is that just everyone is a hideous awful person and she doesn't understand why she would sign up for five and a half more hours of hideous awful people i think that and i guess that uh i would i would say the same about every hbo drama and i because i would say the thing is is that yes and there it's like to me it's like it's a net it's a documentary about douchebags it is a documentary about douchebags but you see some of them have their personality quirks like, oh, this person, like, I, you really like this part of this person. And you really like this part of this person. Like, yeah, man, I wish they didn't, like, do these horrible things. Like, I'm pretty sure they did those horrible things. And then you you find yourself, some of these characters are still doing stuff. And, you know, my girlfriend was watching one of the Instagram live videos from one of these people the other day, yeah, last night. Because it's, like, fascinating to sort of watch this sort of thing and see the animals and stuff. And then the other side of it, you're like, yeah, but this is a thing they did. Um, and for me, that's the thing is that like, uh, you know, we grew up, you know, just like we grew up in South Florida and you get a lot of crazy personalities. And I didn't know the guy that was center to this sort of story, but I had a friend that I think knew him pretty well. And I had, you know, and so I, I was, I had to occasionally take care of a mountain lion. And so I came in contact with other people in that world and you meet people who are really cool, likable people. You like these sort of people. And then you're like, yeah, but there's this other thing. And you're like, oh, that sucks, but I like this person. Like, oh, yeah, but then there's this other other thing. You're like, oh, okay. And I think that's what the documentary knew to me was like, most of these people are very likable, very, mm -hmm. very likable. And then you find out these awful things that they've done, and it's not that yeah, – it's like reality is messy, you know, like that. You know? The, so uh, I, if, at, at the heart of it, I, if I was going to guess – like ultimately, and I think Bonnie would agree with this. She just couldn't handle seeing those teeth. <laughs> I think that's the the alpha and the omega of the whole thing. Is aesthetically, oh, she couldn't God. handle the teeth. It is. It is an unpleasant. I mean, there's a lot of unpleasantness uh, uh, to that entire situation. To all those situations, like even when you get into, uh, uh, you know, some of the stuff that you get into in episode three, and and you start to take a closer look at that organization, and you have to start asking yourself realistically like exactly how different are these scenarios uh yeah. of this, this one to the other uh it, it's it's a show that i think has caught the public attention deservedly uh obviously it's not going to be for everybody because it's you know nothing is for everybody but oh my god it is certainly something that i have i have enjoyed talking living vicariously through my friends who are seeing it for the first time well and mm -hmm. and now we're to the point where I, I i'm so infected with the tiger king bug i'm starting i sent over to justin um uh, john rail sent me a link to this like 12 minute documentary on the movie roar that uh, i think it's oh, good yeah. good bad movies did a little short uh, recap of the whole thing oh and, wow yeah. uh, legitimately the most dangerous movie ever made the most irresponsible movie ever made uh, 70 people were injured on set and that's only counting the ones that actually went to the hospital and uh, the uh, the idea of the movie was what if a bunch of cats moved into a derelict house and they asked around and including uh, uh, in the cast is Melanie Griffith and it's, it's her family. And they asked around, yeah, Hey, how would yeah. we do this if we wanted to have a lot of big cats? And they said, don't, but if you did, you should start by raising them from cubs and have only family members as the <laughs> cast. And so they immediately went to work doing that. They had over a hundred big cats on the set. Uh, it's um, uh, uh, what, what's his name? Jan de Bont 
had over a hundred stitches. Guy. Yeah, his uh, the guy who went on to do, direct uh, Twister and um, Speed. Uh, oh, that's right, yeah. Speed. Uh, who yeah. still has a favorable opinion of the whole experience. It's <laughs> remarkable. Bonkers. I mean, if you just look at the things that made the movie, there are <laughs> moments that are like, that just made the movie where tigers are mauling like famous actors. And, and you're like, one of those clips on a grainy cell phone now would get something shut down forever. Like, there's just, uh, yeah, Melanie Griffith was mauled by a lion. There's one scene that I guess made the movie where they had a safe word it, with yeah, the director. The name. director's name, Noel, was shout the director's name, Noel, and then we'll shut down shooting. And so, unfortunately, Noel sounds delightfully enough like the word screaming no, as you know, as you would say while acting while a big cat mauls you, that uh, that Noel, upon hearing his name, just decided to keep on shooting. So apparently the safe word meant nothing. Yeah, uh, just just a remarkable story. And uh, uh, yeah, go, go, go. That, that is worth the watch. The good, bad movies rundown of of roar uh it was absolutely fascinating and uh uh you know i i, I would encourage everybody yeah uh, oh but i, I guess lead to, oh go ahead oh yeah and it, but it did lead to tippy hedron's continued interest in animal preservation though <laughs> you know as they you know started off where like hey we went to africa these animals are special we should make a movie it's what we do we're a hollywood people <laughs> and then yeah. oh maybe not such a good idea but maybe let's find a way to care for these animals <laughs> uh they definitely were raising just a lion as a pet. And I guess uh, somebody from Life Magazine found out and did this whole pictorial spread. It's just surreal. Uh, kids playing in the pool with a giant freaking lion. Yeah, that's the thing about, like, the different big cats and their temperaments and stuff is that, like, lions let you know how they feel. And that's why sometimes people get into that sort of false sense of feeling safe around them because you have lions and having a bad mood. You give them, you know, good clearance and whatever. And you see people do crazy things with lions, like putting your head in the lion's mouth and stuff like this. Tigers change their opinion, change their moods really, really, really quick. And then, you know, you look at like where a lot of accidents happen with people who work with them. And because they'll think like, oh, because usually what you do is you move them from one one compound to another to go clean or put food or whatever. And you get the person who's maybe not the regular handler for it goes into clean and they didn't do a head count. They didn't realize this. And the one of the things you never, ever supposed to really do is turn your back on any of them because they just instinctually can't help them. And so you look at like, you know, you see people playing in a pool with a line. It's like, oh, it's like a big dog. And then it's not, you know, and, yeah, on that yeah, Roar documentary, talking. they were talking about the uh, or that short piece. They were talking about how traditionally you want two handlers for every one big cat. They had uh, over a hundred big cats and exactly two handlers. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> What can go wrong? <laughs> the only the only person who didn't get injured was a guy who was from Kenya who said, I will do whatever you want me to do, except for befriend these cats. Because where I come from, I understand that this is not a good idea. He was the only one to not be injured. But you want to know what? It, it actually reminded me of, uh, remember the whole Cecil the Lion thing that happened a couple of years ago? Oh. Where uh, like some shot you know, a lion yeah. that had apparently been beloved by some element of uh, society. And then I think it was in the times, if not, it was somewhere else, but it was a guy from Africa who wrote the, 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 the pro shooting Cecil, the lion argument that was like, lions kill people. I lived in Africa. If all the dentists in all the world could come into Africa and shoot all the lions, I would be far more happy <laughs> than, than allow the lions to be free. Cologne on his shoes. Yeah. That doesn't make sense. You'd want to put like uh, <laughs> like tuna oil. Sardine like, oil. Yeah. <laughs> she knew. <laughs> she already had that plan. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, on the, on the lion subject, too, it's like, like, hey, imagine that Brian's next door neighbor has a tiger compound and the tiger gets loose and there's a tiger in your backyard. What do you want to do? Shoot it. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, I'm sympathetic to people in other countries where these things naturally live where they're like, Eh, you know, but uh, I mean, there are beautiful creatures and we need to figure out ways to conserve them and protect their habitats. So human cat interactions don't happen. At the same <laughs> ways. 
Uh, I got a pick. Uh, Bryce, you have a pick? Yeah. Uh, I started playing this when it came out uh, last week or so. It is uh, the new Animal Crossing New Horizons. You guys uh, know about Animal Crossing? Uh, yeah, that's where you run a big cat park, right? <laughs> <laughs> you could. I think yeah. I think you could. I think you would have a tough time. So actually, someone in the chat uh, did did share so uh animal crossing if you don't know is like a uh it's a very relaxing game where you can uh, <laughs> uh where you live on an island and you have people who live with you and uh you, you get my clothes and you have villagers and neighbors and you plant trees and stuff it's very relaxing oh. and the thing that's been very fun is seeing people make tiger king references in animal crossing like oh this one geez. It's uh, inappropriate, but just because you read it in that voice, the 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 the, the, the two word <laughs> prefix to Carol Baskin's name. Is... Um, you can just hear oh. you can hear the audio peaking as uh, as that gets rolled out. Uh, look, I, I've been living in an Animal Crossing world. Uh, uh, pretty much all me and my wife uh, do is. Uh, work and then i watch her play animal crossing or we're watching uh whatever the the the, the netflix or streaming uh uh thing of the of, of of the day is but uh yeah a lot of uh, a lot of animal crossing it, it's a fairly remarkable game i i can see why it it uh you know has kind of taken off especially as everybody is cooped up because it is just as much of a social network as it is any kind of linear gameplay. What is the yeah. core gameplay dynamic? Is it like a collecting game or? Um, it's 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 kind of akin to Minecraft. Like the series predates Minecraft a, a little bit, but you basically like you you start on a, in this game you start on a deserted island with two other neighbors, villagers, and you are uh, <laughs> uh, uh, planting trees and selling stuff and and earning money to. Uh, to cust it's a lot of customization. You know, you can decorate your town and your home, um, as well as like terraforming and 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 sort of taming the the wilderness, if you will. Um, and so it's 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 not a lot of like there's not like a boss or like st stuff to do. You know, mm. it, it's uh, it, it has a very interesting dynamic of like. Uh, I mean, you you could spend a lot of time playing it every day if you want, but for most people, they will probably spend thirty to sixty minutes a day because there's only so much that you can do in a day, um, because it runs on time. a real time so, real time clock. Yeah, yeah. yeah so it, it runs on the same time that you run and you interact with people. But like most of what I'll see is actually like talking with somebody on an app mm -hmm. like that has their its own VOIP. And uh, you go back and forth and trade things, but it is this like nice core morphine for an anxious age. Yeah. So uh, Animal Crossing New Horizons out now on the Switch. Sweet. Gentlemen, it's been weird. <laughs> hey, Bryce. Yeah. Did you see that image? That, I did see it. <laughs> that Amish um, overlord just put in. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> that lookalike in that music video looks a lot like her. That's <laughs> he wasn't a bad musician either. Uh, well, oh, so there's oh. there's a question about the lineage no, of that production. Yeah. 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 Whoever whoever sang that. Um, yeah, that's a. Uh, no, uh, I saw Ashley keeps now. I've infected Ashley with the tell all the hunters <laughs> put down their guns. <laughs> but uh, Ashley, for whatever reason, keeps hearing it as tell all the honeys put down their guns. <laughs> <laughs> no fighting. Like, ironically, I'll just hear tell all the honeys <laughs> put down their guns. Oh, man. I, uh, I, I have there there are some people I will like try and poke and see if they've seen Tiger King or try to recommend it to them but that there that clip in was it episode 5 is is going to be very difficult for a lot of people. it's still very tough for me yeah. to uh circle that square in my head. Oh, oh, the one where you don't even see the thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. that the the reacts to video. <laughs> that is that is that is full <sighs> Odd. Libertarian Odd. reacts to exercise of oh, rights. Oh, <laughs> it it was a thing where I mentioned this when you guys were chatting on it on the stream. It was like if they had the angle of it, 
I think they definitely would have shown it. And that's that it's one of many intrusive yeah. thoughts playing in my head right now. Yeah, I don't know exactly where they would have landed on on showing it. But what, what, what we get, especially at the point that we get it, like you are already so wrung out from surprises at that point in the series, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like you're 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 almost like thankful that you're on something that like kind of makes sense in terms of him deciding to apply his uh, fame to you know public office or whatever. You're like, okay, this. This seems like this doesn't no one's engaging in male fraud or worse. There's no like horrifying dark secret. He's just doing normal local kook thing and, and running for office and making videos. And then that happens and you're like, oh, <laughs> I don't know where I don't know what to do. I'm lost on which thing. Oh, and you haven't seen it yet. You have not seen it yet. I seen no, I've thing. seen the whole thing. I've seen. The whole oh, thing. I thought you said you were only a couple episodes in the uh, security footage. Oh, the security footage oh, yeah, where yeah, his yeah. campaign manager reacts yeah, to yeah. Oh, the yeah, accident. I thought, I wasn't yeah, I sure the connection to what he did that was awful and everything else was awful. Gotcha, oh, gotcha. Yeah, but, yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, no, there, there are things that you go like. There is a checklist. There's the bingo in my head from the moment they start was like, well, this drug's going to come up because looking at this person, and then. Who's not giving on camera stuff right now? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is going to play a part, you know. And there's this, I had that little sort of bingo of like, you know, hey, there's a weird, I'm like, sometimes it's, you don't know exactly, like, there's something off here about the way this is being shot or not. And then you're like, oh, this is why. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh, it's delightful. All right. More, more of this, more of this. <laughs> All right, well, let's get ready to do after things here. Uh, if you need to go get a drink. So, oh. so Brian, were you thinking at any point during this, like, I've got some space? Oh, man. <laughs> I've got some. Uh, like, the, uh, the parallels were not lost on me. <laughs> <laughs> also, thank you to um, uh, the game mechanic who gave us a, a really big grade. Thank you so much. That is uh, very sweet. Uh, all right, so we're going to do After Things, our, our uh, podcast about yeah, creativity okay. here in just a few moments. Uh, this is the time when uh, uh, the guys um, uh, go and get drinks and, and refresh and get ready for another hour of podcasting. There we go. Uh, we're going to switch to just chatting. Just because... Just cause. Just cause. Justin. Yeah. So are you are you playing um like on Ashley's Animal Crossing Island at all? Or are you just watching? I, nothing. Nothing. One person addicted to heroin in this household is enough. I don't need <laughs> both of us addicted to the same heroin. Uh that would be a problem. But you and it would ultimately lead to me uh, having to, you know, uh, go camp out in front of a Walmart so I can get the one switch that comes in because those apparently in the Bay Area are going like that's that's the actual thing that we're going to be able to uh, trade to the the new warlords uh, <laughs> after all society collapses yeah. we'll be able to our switches because those are the big things no uh, uh, we did actually play a little bit of um, Mario Kart uh, online Sure. Because Ashley is very good at Mario Kart, and uh, and so we just took yesterday as as like her just tutoring me on how to be better. Um, but uh, yeah, that was pretty much all we did. And then um, you know she's obviously on the uh, on the on the uh, uh, Animal Crossing thing. But other than that, I've been screwing around with uh, Hearthstone a little bit more. But that's mm -hmm. been all. All, all the Vigi games I've been into. Yeah, now that they nerfed uh, the whole bunch of the cards that I relied on, um, I had to find a new deck, and I found out that uh, f uh, uh, two of the cards that I needed for this uh, Mech Pally uh, were, uh, you had to finish the Galakron single-player adventure. So I've gone through, and uh, I've done like 80, 90% of that now. <clears throat> nice. But uh, but it looks like, according to HS Replay, um, I... If, if if you're down for it, I'll send you a copy of it. It looks like it's performing really well. Yeah, I might have to go through that uh, that that 
uh, thing first, but yeah, no, I've been I've been really enjoying myself in Battlegrounds, um, and I'll, I'll screw around a little bit now that they sh they you know jumbled it up a little bit, um, but uh, I feel like I'm ready to get back on the ladder. Uh, Battlegrounds gave me a good little uh, I'll tell you what. Uh, ref uh, if you if, if, when when you do if you if you're streaming, um, uh, I'll I'll be happy to play oats uh, to your hearth. <laughs> Yeah, no, we should definitely figure out some uh, figure out some time. In fact, are, do you have time to do this after? Yeah, we could go straight into it as soon as soon as we wrap up. As long as it looks like four thirty is is whatever this group call is that I'm supposed to be on. So so I okay. uh, if if we start in thirty or forty minutes, then that'll give us an hour. Cool. Okay. Well, uh, then let's. So yeah, did you did you hear that, Andrew? We, we could probably only go about. 30 or 40 minutes for after things. Cool. Okay. All right. Well, then uh, let's catch you into after things. How about that? Let's get started in three, two. Hello, and welcome to After Things. I'm Andrew Mead, joined by Brian Brushwood. Hello, beautiful people. Mr. Bryce Castillo. Hi, everybody. That's me. Justin Robert Young. Hey. Uh, gentlemen, I thought we might give some little updates on all of our respective projects. Uh, Brian, I would love to get a little update. How has the compound been working out? <laughs> uh, well, the good news is uh, we've bought more infrastructure in anticipation of our big Founders Day picnic. Oh, dear God. <laughs> uh, Thankfully, it, it wasn't like a bunch of perishables. It's stuff that we can use. Oh, mostly. correct. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they were known upgrades that we knew we needed, um, like a PA system, because if we're going to do a live show, you're going to want a PA system with proper monitors and all that stuff. We got a snake that I think we'll be setting up probably tomorrow during the day because we'll have uh, some music for Night Attack tomorrow. Oh, right on. Yeah, oh, that's oh. right. Um, and Wait, oh, oh, what? Uh, it's, a, a, it's called a snake. Basically, it's uh, like 16 XLR cords all taped together so they all can... You can have hookups on stage instead of here at the board. And then, okay, and then we're not a, a walking OSHA disaster at all times. <laughs> Only yeah. part of the time. Uh, the Oh, oh we, uh, we did... Um, we, 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 we bit the big bullet on putting in a proper AC system for the soundstage just in time, you know, because we needed it to keep it cool during this hot summer months mm. if we're going to do a live show. Uh, and also all of those shoots that we're going to do in the live so Oh, wait, that's right. Uh, <laughs> because everybody's stay sheltering in place right now. Um, but uh, but we also, we also installed, uh, we got electricity, uh, sort of an, an electricity island between the soundstage and the main house that we were able to put both a Z-Wave connector and a Eero Wi-Fi extender. So now inside the soundstage, which is a good 150, 200 yards away, you think that's about right? That might be a bit much. Um, but I'm no good at okay, distances. But, uh, yeah, <laughs> probably 150 yards away, but yeah. but uh, the whole front two acreage, you're able to get 60 megabits down everywhere now. Nice. Uh, so bit of a bummer that all of that had to get uh, expended just you know for this event and then the event is postponed but um uh but but at least we have that thing mm -hmm. so in the meantime it's a, it's a bit of a ghost town around here there's pretty much just three of us who kind of come and go and occasionally are all in the same place at the same time mm -hmm. well i mean it's, it looks amazing every time i see photos of that i'm just really impressed by what they will put together and, and just how this is you know and uh, wait, I mean, not to say that in my head it was just going to be like, you know, you and like some dirty shack next to a lawnmower with a microphone. Um, <laughs> maybe more closer to that expectation. Uh, what you built looks great. I, I see the interior is your thing, and I see like the interiors of where out in Texas where uh, SpaceX is building the rocks. I'm like, man, these look like similar facilities. Yeah, so, it, it, it is, it is coming along. It's just, uh, man, it's just a slow grind, and I suppose that's the, the one lesson – um, on the one hand, it just seems like nothing gets done and everything's moving at a snail's pace. But then you look back and just one year ago, there was no building. There was no uh, mm -hmm. ability for us to work out of this. I mean, it's uh, if, if you look at it on the geologic era scale, a lot is happening very quickly. Yeah, for sure. Oh, wait. Justin, so uh, what's been going on in politics and... Your politics is there anything in politics right now? <laughs> raise the dead. Can we get an update on that? Uh, yeah, it's uh, you know, we're we're kind of playing it by year with raise the dead because uh, there were elements that um, 
you know, I was going to kind of parlay into a season two based on the, um, you know, the events of, of this season. Uh, I don't know right now exactly uh, where we're going to be able to compare stuff. So I've kind of taken um, a, a little bit of a wait and see approach with, with Raise the Dead. Of course, the ebook's available. The audio book is now available. Um, and the audiobook uh, has a, a bonus episode that um, was not included in the podcast feed. So, uh, yeah, you know, it, it's it's out there. Uh, my my kind of like a, a, a quarantine strategy is I, I was thinking about re-recording and I still might do a mini episode that might be one or two ep- one or two. Um, episodes about this one thing that definitely did happen that I can compare to the 1964 election. Um, but for right now, I just kind of wanted to keep my editing sharp. And so I've been doing this very stupid podcast um, weekly about Billy Crystal movies in the 90s called Crystal. And um, the, the the method to my madness there, aside it being a, a sure sign of my worsening mental health, is... Uh, <laughs> that I just wanted to, I wanted to edit. I wanted to edit in the same style that I edit Raise the Dead. I wanted to research in the same style uh, as Raise the Dead, but I didn't want to do something that might make people think that Raise the Dead is something other than, uh, you know, what it is, which is fairly highly researched, fairly polished. I wanted to just kind of continue to work that out. So now, uh, yeah, on the jury podcast, uh, feed. If you subscribe to Jury or Jury Daily, it's on the same feed. You can get it right now. Um, is uh, Crystal, which uh, is just me watching Billy Crystal movies from 1989 to 2001, and uh, it's one part Plague Diary, one part Billy Crystal review show, and one part a uh, history lesson of something else worldwide that happened in a horrifying manner in the same year that these delightful Billy Crystal movies got released. <laughs> so, so uh, to remind us that. Uh, you know that that there even then there were people that were in crisis and didn't know which way the world was moving left or right. Uh, but hell, did they get to watch City Slickers? Hey, so on that subject of mental health and projects to preserve one's mental health, uh, I was talking last night with uh, Andrew Heaton, who made the self discovery that uh, as an extreme extrovert, he needs to not just talk to people, but but see their faces and feel dialed in on a conversation. So he's made the habit of, he and I have pretty much daily been FaceTiming here and again. And I was, I was telling him uh, about my pick from the Weird Things podcast, uh, Half-Life Alex. And uh, we were talking about VR in general. And I suggested to him, even though it's a very major expense, uh, he is uh, trapped in a one bedroom apartment and, and all he wants to do is be outside and visiting and talking with people. And I suggested that even though it is an expensive investment, I think that for his mental health, he would very much benefit from, you know, a Vive room scale VR experience. So because, you know, there's chat rooms and there's that that subjective feeling of being outdoors and feeling like you're not restricted and you could go anywhere. I uh, I I don't know. It's it's it seems like a responsible thing to spend money on right now, but um but maybe that's me just being a fanboy telling other people to get on the train. On on a similar take, uh one of the other social communities I'm in outside of the Diamond Club uh has, is starting to do like happy hour like Zoom meetings, like getting on a big just like video call. Uh I think the first one we did was on Wednesday and there was like 30 people or, or so, which was just, it was a lot, but it was, it was fun to, to, to talk to everybody and, you know, a, a couple hours, uh, you know, once or twice a week and just that little bit, just like, and, and, and not just like being on the meeting, but like, kind of like having like everyone like stopping and just being able to like, you know, focus on this. Like I went and bought liquor, which I had not, I had not had a drink for a little while, uh, just because I'd never had any <laughs> reason to go or ability to go out lately uh and so just like having having that moment to kind of replicate talking to people uh is good you know discord or zoom skype it is out. it is kind of funny in that whole like beer versus liquor thing where it's like socially you'll find yourself sooner or later in a restaurant or a bar and you could have a drink or a couple right um but then 
Then you cross over that boundary. It's like, there's only one place to get the hard stuff. <laughs> and it's this place. <laughs> it, we're, we're a necessary uh, utility yeah. here Still in the Still closed on Sundays, though. Hmm. Yeah. Weird. Interesting. <laughs> Um, but yeah, you know, like, you, you know, you, you don't have to go out and buy $2,000 with the VR equipment and computers and all, but, uh, e- even just like little stuff like that, or, te- uh, th- this was a thing I saw, uh, on, on Twitter. It's like, text your parents, text your friends. Like if you're like, I don't like texting very much, uh, and, but I know I'm bored and I know all my friends are bored and, uh, it's good to text them and make sure that they're not, you know, stir crazy. Yeah, uh, two things. One is, if, like I mentioned before, if you don't want to go all in on a VR rig, the Oculus Quest is great. You're not going to play, mm. you know, Half Life Alex on that. It's just can't. It's not designed for that. You you could cable it to your if you have a PC gaming thing, you can do it, but it's still that part's beta and stuff. But for a lot of other things, a lot of the great VR and a lot of the social VR stuff, you can use the Oculus Quest or even the Go. The Oculus Go, you can get for 150 bucks. And you can participate in like some of the Facebook events and things like that with it, which is, you know, they do live concerts and stuff inside of there. Uh, the Go, like I said, it's 150 bucks. It doesn't give you the full six degrees of freedom, but you're in a different environment. And I've had a lot of fun just playing with the Go, and you know, even though I have better gear. Um, man, <laughs> it's like I'm, I know I'm wired differently because I'm like. Oh, I don't have to go anywhere. I just get to stay in and work on stuff and work on my projects. And I'm like, I think, and that's my to my detriment, perhaps. But I just you don't I, feel like, like oh, you you don't feel like just the fact that you shouldn't go out changes things. Like my day to day hasn't changed too too much, but just the fact that I know I shouldn't go out. Um, I still go for walks. I still sure. go for walks. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I put on gloves. I make sure, like, you know, I don't touch anything, and I bring gloves and a mask in case if I'm if a crowd of joggers were to come towards me, whatever. Mm-hmm. I still go for walks and stuff, but I don't. I'm, I've always been such a a hermit that um, it's just you know the only thing I thought that I go, man, I really miss is Korean barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> you know? I mean, like, let me, I'm just let me let me put it this way: when I used to work with Andrew in Florida. There were times, most days, we would go to lunch, right? But then there would sometimes be stretches, and it would be while Andrew was in the middle of a project or he had some deadline or something that had to happen, and it might be a couple days, right? And then fold that in over a weekend that I just knew that when I got that call on Tuesday, this was a very important Arby's uh, uh, trip. <laughs> like, you know, because there was, there was a, a totally starved... Andrew, who had just kind of lost to to the ether the fact that five days had passed uh, because it was it was uh, all in focus and and this was this was a moment where I wanted to be there for my friend. So I can totally understand where, especially now that Andrew has somebody else in the house, like you know, like oh, I mean that's like ninety percent of why you'd leave in the first place. And not a prisoner, by the way. She's not a prisoner. Not a prisoner. But like, yeah, I get, I, once I get on focused on something, like I've talked about this before, like I cannot multitask at all. I have to have hundred percent of my attention on a thing. And once I do though, once I get in, I think flow is something I think comes to me pretty easily. And once it's there, like I, I built a thing, uh, I don't know, was it talking to somebody Monday or Tuesday? I'm like, man, you know, I'm walking around and there are all these, you know, restaurants that are open with signs up, but nobody gets to see the restaurants because the signs, cause they're all inside. Wouldn't it be neat if you could just print out a thing to put on your refrigerator that says, uh, hey, here's a list of places I like to go to. I'm like, yeah, I'd be cool. I'm like, well, I guess I could make a, a web app for that. And then it's like 24 hours later, I had had takeout.page, you know, because I was like, ah, and that was just me just hyper-focused on trying to create something. And so um, that's the advantage of it. Uh, the disadvantage is uh, – I, you know, tend to lose track of time. And I'm like, holy crap, all of a sudden, you know, a week has gone by. You know, I built a thing. I made a thing, but I haven't talked to anybody. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the person they find alone in an apartment that paid it up for several years. And nobody realized that, you know, <laughs> One of those stories of, of the old lady who prepaid for many, many years? Yeah, it's find me a way at my computer writing something. You know, the screen's still flickering. That's funny. So, uh, no, yeah, I yeah. definitely live a bit of a goldfish existence where um, I wake up and I'm so, so happy to see the family and the kids and 
and uh, maybe I'll just get a little bit of email done and oh, oh more family, more kids. huh? And then uh, uh, that hits a tipping point around 1130 when I'm like, I need to go to the other place and then I go to the other place <laughs> yeah. and then work until finally it's like, oh, man, you'd be great to see family and kids and watch Battlestar Galactica. Mm. Uh, so um, uh, it is it is. Uh, uh, it's it's astonishing this kind of ping pong existence, and I guess back to the subject of liquor stores, we did that one episode on how to make homemade hand sanitizer using Everclear 190 proof, and uh, I went by to see if they had Everclear because once hand san- hand sanitizer became the new gold standard, uh, I was like, oh, well, let me get some more, and dude was like, no, we got cleaned out, and then uh, a few days later, I checked in, and he was like, oh, I did get some. And he, he's checking me out with the Everclear. And then this moment, like this wave comes over him and he looks at me with genuine concern and, and says, you're not going to drink that, are you? <laughs> and I was like, oh, Christ, no. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can, I just want to do like a little aside to like, uh, if you're a journalist and, and you're not listening to this, but if you were hypothetically and you're doing your list of helpful things and advice, telling people like, oh, like, oh, don't make your own hand sanitizer. Like, I see a lot of those things like, oh, you're better off not making your own. Like, we have this alternative. Like, we're going, man, I could just go to CVS and pick up a carton full of this stuff. But no, I'm going to go buy a much more expensive thing and make my own. You know, those things that sort of drive me nuts is like the sort of the intent to sort of help but not understanding the situation we're in. We're like, there aren't alternatives in cases. You know? Yeah. Like, you know, th- there is a thing that's kind of being exposed now that information actually matters. Um and that is the fact that for a lot of different reasons, journalism, the way that we understand it, has kind of become somebody says a thing, 50,000 other people all compete to say, see the best, or sorry, the most engageable headline that they can write on that thing. Whether or not that thing is good or bad, but it's like, but, but then the, the market then becomes... Like if somebody's if, if if the thing is, hey, you can't use house like regular household liquors, for example, like, like you know, Tito's vodka was saying, hey, we do not do not use us for hand sanitizer. We do not have enough uh, of, you know, of power to to do that in our proof uh, that that now becomes the most provocative way that you can say it takes more than just stuff you have lying around to make hand sanitizer is don't make hand sanitizer as opposed to, Hey, you would, you know, it would take, you know, money and probably products you don't have, but you know, I guess we're just sitting around. And, and on top of that, there's that weird compulsion everybody has in the comments to just bark out and parrot whatever the thing is on that subject that they've seen before, that they speak with complete authority because they watched some other YouTuber's video who had a different opinion. And because they watched that first, they all know for a fact that you must be wrong. Like, it's very clear nobody has hands-on experience with any of that. And and also, everybody assumes, like, for example, one of the earliest episodes of The Modern Rogue we did was how to make a homemade um, a, a gas mask, you know, for the purposes of withstanding tear gas or whatever. And we, we made it. We used the activated charcoal. We did it, all that stuff. And comments are still coming in where people are like... Uh, you're better off just buying one TBH. <laughs> it's Duh. like, no yeah. crap, Sherlock. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, like, uh, there's also just like a lot of misinformation going out or uh, going out there around there. You know, um, the, the two big things I've seen a lot are, uh, oh, hey, look at these photos of Venice. The water is clear and the animals are back. And they're not photos of Venice. They're photos of a similar waterlocked city that, always has clean water and always has animals anyway. Mm. And then the thing that was going around, which is um, don't take ibuprofen because all of these people who died had taken ibuprofen. This is a very common drug. <laughs> don't, don't hydrate yourself. All these people who died were They're 80% water. Well, and, well, that, well, let's get in the ibuprofen because that sure. was a thing where there was an advisory from, I think, like the French health officials or something about ibuprofen. They had issued an advisory and they're like, oh, OK, then maybe we should avoid it. And that went over. So there was an official advisory. Now there's more data. And they're like, no, nah, that doesn't seem to be the case. If you need to take ibuprofen, take it. And that's one of the problems where it's even responsible people. Now, we were getting who like who if it, like, oh, yeah, no, a mask yeah. is not going to help you. 
that's not true. <laughs> you know, if somebody is spitting phlegm in front of your face, whatever, a mask is really helpful for reducing the particle. Now we get the difference of filters and how viruses can fit through smaller things, but some of the particles, particles we're trying to avoid are bigger and whatever, and it also avoid keeps you from touching your face. And that was one of the frustrating things because you find out that some health officials are worried about like, well, we don't want a mask shortage. Well, and, and yeah, even from a people and even from a behavioral standpoint, I noticed when I went to the grocery store that I would give a wider berth to anybody who was wearing a mask because it was an objective outward signal that I am very concerned and and I would appreciate, you know, you helping me out in that. And it was it was it was an unconscious thing for me to do. Yeah, and it's one of things like they've done studies, and again, check everything we say. <laughs> like, yeah, don't go, well, those guys said it. Vet everything, vet everything, multiple sources, look for things that are coming from responsible organizations, whatever. But I saw a study on the internet, so it must be true, but it showed that like even masks that are not N95 still are better than nothing. They show like how they were able to reduce the amount of stuff impact because you, you do have a barrier between your face, some things that caught, and it was able to reduce the viral load. And the problem is people go like, well, no, the virus is too small. It'll fit right through. Like, yes, if we're looking at it on that level, that on that that micro level, that is absolutely true. But on a macro level, will it reduce the amount of stuff that gets into your lungs, whatever? And the answer is, well, of course, absolutely it will and prevent these other things. And you get that sort of the, when we talk to a virologist who pointed out that this, like, yes, that part is true. But going back, will it reduce? Well, yes. And it's like, that's the thing that frustrates me most is, health officials who should know better who are giving us sort of conflicting information. And, and that's, you know, we are in a situation right now where you, know, you talk about the fog of war, right? That, that, you know, the fog of war is in the middle of all the craziness. You often, it, it becomes harder and harder to see the forest from the trees. And we actually kind of create our own little version of that on social media. Like we, the, 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 there is no clearing of the radio lines. We are all still interacting at all times. And not to say that we shouldn't, I think we should, but also you just gotta be clear that like, there's a lot of stuff that I read either from foreign sources for which you can use all the same rubrics of like, and we know it on this show better than anything that when you, when you read foreign stories, very often, especially the ones that kind of confirm a thing that's happening domestically or, or seem kind of too good to be true. Almost universally, they're not exactly the way that you think that they, that, 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 that you're interpreting they are. Uh, and, and now we're just in a crisis. We're in a literal crisis where everybody is trying to look out for their, I, I do believe empathetically, they are trying to look out for what they believe is the best case scenario, but man, Now's the time. If you don't take like Googling things uh, seriously, like now's the time to, to take the, the after things Google it challenge. And just whenever you read some of this stuff, just take a, take another, take a closer gander, especially if it seems important. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, you know, should have been sort of our protocol to begin with because, and I have people who I know, I think are smart who have fit, sent me stuff and I'm like, there's no original source to this. You didn't look this up. You just forward this thing to somebody. I'm like, you know you can go to the CDC website to see if this came from here. You know you can go to this other place to find out the original source on this. And the danger that comes from people, like I've, I've had friends of friends forward me like absolutely idiotic things that like would get people killed, you know, if they took that seriously and put themselves in a dangerous situation. Like, oh, well, this is the thing and, and it's credible. Like, how do you, well, because it says it's from this person. Like, yeah, somebody literally wrote the name of a of an organization in there and forward you a thing that's just pure text. It's like ah, you know, basic basic comprehension skills elude even smart people. Man, um, that, and I would that, say be, that would be the 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 generator, right? Like my uh, Mad Lib style of a family, like you know, <laughs> profession, right? Or, or or family member or friend uh, is uh, uh, close with important job at important research facility uh, uh, and they have the following advisory and then just pick some other just grab bag words and and throw that together grab bag symptoms throw that together hit send uh, to entire address book yeah and don't look back that. like a cool guy walking away from an explosion <laughs> yeah 
we all we all and and I know particularly myself I need to be more cognizant of of the thing that is the 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 retrograde like look at all the stupid things these people said or whatever and it's fine I mean, it does it's sort of a thing to say how credible should I treat them now about things to be sure but there is that that the second guessing game when we need to be kind of in the what do we need to do now game more we need to be paying more attention to like what do we know now what do we know now and that's a thing that's evolved is Things that were fa hazy and uncertain, but maybe we're going to go one way. Now we've gotten a tremendous amount of clarity. Like we see where things are going now, and now it's more critical, I think, to say, you know, be in the moment and thinking forward. You know, I, 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 I've tried to ride that line with PX3 because uh, obviously this is a hotbed for politics. Politicians are leaders in these crisis moments, and now we need them to be the best leaders they can be. Uh, and I, I have said on the show, and I've had to practice what I preach, that I think that there, there are some questions that need to be answered about how these, you know, how how the run up to this happened, and for officials federally on the state level and on the on the more local level in some of the hotspots, there are some real questions that need to be answered. But I hope to live, and I hope everybody in those areas lives long enough so we can start asking those questions because for right now I think there is a necessity the one thing I don't want to do in political commentary is to make somebody who's listening to me distrust official sources now like mm -hmm. because that I think that they are doing the best job or the worst job they are doing at the very least a job that needs to be taken in as part of a balanced breakfast of information and and I don't want to so that kind of discord in, in whatever small way that I can. I don't have the biggest podcast on the planet, but if I, I, I think that we're we're at a point now where, look, it, it doesn't have to last forever. Could be a month, two months, but make sure you're paying attention to the official stuff that is coming out, uh, and yeah, then do with that as there, you will. There was an article that, to be honest, was a bit terrifying. The idea that, that the virus itself and the reactions of social distancing was becoming increasingly politicized. Uh, somebody talked about how he went to the local uh, golf club and um, you know uh, the Democrats were all uh, practicing social distancing and you know red hats were all shaking hands and, and loudly talking about this hoax. And it's like, ooh, that's, that, I, I, I don't care for that. Let's not politicize this, please. Yeah, there was that was a problem. I saw an article about that, and I would say there's uh, you could pull up data that shows that the opposite's been the cases where you look at where it gets affected and stuff, and it's just it's, there's no help in that. And you could certainly say that well, people who are from more rural environments might have this, whatever, and that that's a dangerous thing because we want to we want to we want to pick a, time, a, a t side and blame and go look what these people are doing in that, and it's like. Man, the virus does not know your political affiliations. And you look at some of the first people to get struck down by this were wealthy people who traveled a lot, whatever, who probably fit into one other demographic. But then, you know, your health worker or somebody who's got to work as an orderly in a hospital doesn't care what your political affiliation is. It's going to affect you the same. A lot of our first responders. And, and so it, it gets, yeah, it gets into this sort of like, it's frustrating to see that. Um, and I would say, too, like if you're looking one of the problems, the era we live in, which now, too, is that the idea of declaring yourself a fact checker is a really good way to assert your own opinions on stuff on things. And you see stuff. Well, this fact checks is this. And it's like. Who fact checks the fact checks and and, and Snopes is often a good site, but that Snopes is a core. I don't trust them when they're going to interpret something for me when they can just put it in front of me. And that's been my thing where it's been frustrating is that, um, you know, they're they're like, uh you know, some of us good, but when they're going to interpret what well, this person said, well, this meant this, whatever. It's like, no, just show me what they said and let us come to our own opinions. That 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 idea that we have to tell you if this is true or false can be problematic when it's more subjective things, but it can be very useful for. They're wonderful when it like did the CDC issue this statement? Was this email coming from there? Whatever. That's a great source for that. But interpretation. <laughs> so, any picks? Um, oh, I had one, but I have temporarily forgotten it. Um, I, I don't think I've mentioned it last week, but we're going back and I got the kids watching Battlestar Galactica and it's not only 
one of the greatest science fiction shows of all time, especially the it's one of the greatest first seasons of anything of all time. But it's especially delightful to realize that Battlestar Galactica as a meditation on what a post 9-11 world looked like is fascinating because it manages to cast the humans in both roles. In the first season, the humans are after a Pearl Harbor type, you know, disaster that destroys everyone. You know, they, they got 9-11 and now there's only 50,000 people left and they're on the run and they're they're hunting from within their own ranks for Cylons because they look like us now. You know, it's a, it's a very easy metaphor to uh, think back to what it was like with some of the uh, anti-Islamic uh, reactionary attitudes in a post 9-11 world within America. But then later, there uh, is, in later seasons, there's a time when humans are trying to hide in New Caprica, and the Cylons come in with this you know, this giant, grandiose plan, like, no, 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 we know what's best for you, we're going to take care of you, we're going to occupy this area. And then you find yourself, now the humans are cast in the role of, of citizens who, um, you know, in the thinly veiled uh, allegory to the Iraq War uh, or Afghanistan, you know, you're suddenly rooting for humans as they commit suicide bombings in there. Um, it's uh, with a little bit of distance between now and those events, it becomes a lot more interesting to see how we dealt with those times in fiction, especially extremely well-crafted science fiction. So I enjoyed it quite a bit. It is, it is a wonderful show and it's interesting to see that it, it's one of those things that came out and changed the trajectory of other science fiction. You know, you oh, it elevated you the game watch, for everyone. Yeah. You can't watch last, uh, last Jedi and not realize how much that show probably influenced Johnson's, you know, yeah. thinking on that. And Ronald B. Moore, you know, got brought in to help work on a lot of other sci-fi stuff and whatnot. And because it was just, it yeah, just showed how good it could be. Uh, hey, I got a pick. If you're uh, a psychopath like I am and want to uh, watch broad data come in about this plague. Uh, you can go to World O Meters, uh, World Letter O Meters dot info slash coronavirus. Uh, it's just raw data. It's something that I've watched a lot, specifically if you're trying to, you know, anchor yourself against a lot of the interpretations of stuff that's going on. Um, it's helpful to just kind of see what the numbers are. And for those of you who are listening to the px3 uh, uh shows where i'm doing the hyperbole free coronavirus update this and um the new york times has a single always updating page of places that are um in shelter at home orders uh but that's where i've been getting sourcing all the numbers uh for stuff and, like that just and, and can we just take a moment to talk to, to the 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 thing about numbers, and I think for many of our people, we don't have to remind you, but uh, when it comes to like country by country and even region by region, everybody is self-reporting and the ways these data is accumulated varies. And sometimes the way they count cases can be different. You know, we saw, we, we predicted on the show two weeks ago or so, once testing went increased and we were going to find about all these new cases, there would be this sort of panic. And predictably that happened once we ramped up to like 100,000 tests per day in the United States. People are like, oh my God, look at all these cases. It's like, yes, when you test more people, you get more positive results, but still that logical sort of thing kind of eluded people. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of data. So I just be kind of mindful, like understand that like, that you're you're only the data doesn't tell you the real picture the data tells you what we're able to find out it's only yeah. where we're able to look and we've seen you know the comparisons of the cases and stuff i don't know anybody credible who believes anything coming out of china right now when when china has actively shut down reporters and anybody trying to report on this <laughs> there was the there, there was a an article that said seems like they are ordering more urns than they have reported deaths <laughs> what's going yeah, on i mean <laughs> And we have to, we have to like, and there are those, yeah, there are the, and like, listen, I'm a, I'm a China skeptic, let me clear, but you have to be skeptical of that stuff too, because there might be, I don't know what the daily number was, and did they shut down another mortuary there, and that was why all the cases went to this other one. There was the story that like 20 million cell phones appeared to vanish from the cell phone networks over there. And I read that, I'm like, maybe, maybe, like that would be in line with the idea, I don't, I mean, that's a lot, but like, like, but it's, yeah, it's China, it's China and 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 they've lied about you know a lot of things because that's a totalitarian government. Any government does that can get away with it will do. 
if our government could control, completely control the press like China did, they would do that. And so um, I, I just watch the data, but be mindful because I hear people say like, go like, oh, my God, look what's going on in the U.S. Like, yeah, it's it's bad here. But but look at the mortality rates here and then look at other countries and you realize like, oh, you know, we need to test more. And they're really not testing enough because either either this is their hospital care is so horrible in these other countries, people are dying at a higher rate or it preys upon people's sort of genotypes or there's just a lot more cases than we realize in those other places too. So I just, data is great, but you got to put those asterisk, asterisk, asterisks by it. Just, yeah, just be, be aware. This, this kind of thing is, there's no perfect way. There's no God mode that you can just exit out to the menu and see server wide stats, right? Like, like all of this is fallible. Uh, the only thing that I have found any kind of peace in is uh, just tracking, uh, you know, uh, uh, deaths are not a perfect st uh, a statistic, as Andrew said. Um, but at the very least, uh, you know, it, somebody died, right? And it wasn't a, a percentage of how many cases are, you know, being found versus the testing. Like, I don't know. I, I've, I have found it helpful for me. Oh, no, I, I look at this stuff all the time. And I'm not saying, I'm just being mindful. And, and I the, the thing that frustrates me is, Journalists, I've seen some gotcha sort of things about like so and so said this, but that's false because this data said it here. And it's like, yeah, read the asterisk. That data takes 24 hours to be put into there. So and so said this based upon data that they're getting 24 hours before it goes into there. And and that's the thing that frustrates me is this sort of like, we're gonna use it for gotcha and whatever. And it's like the map is not the territory. You know, we're trying to get a grasp of what's going on, we're trying to understand what this is. And yes, it is. It can be a thing to kind of get you. This is sort of what we think we know, but just put those asterisks by it. Yeah. Uh, I got a pick. I have a presumptive pick because I kept seeing that this was out, and then uh, kept not making the time to watch it. But uh, Ozark season three is out on Netflix now. Ooh, I'm playing catch up on season two last night. Um, season two's good. Uh, it's it's all right. It it I don't feel the same stakes in season two that I did on season one. Like season one had that delightful, mm -hmm. oh this guy's screwed the entire way, but he's starting to act a little bit more like an impenetrable superhero, and at least you know three episodes in or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm not afraid of the main cast getting killed anymore, which is sort of reducing my tension, but but uh, I am excited to get caught up on season three. Yeah, uh, season three, at least the trailers for it look very action-packed. action, action -packed. They've got um, uh, the, a thing happened, and now they get to do stuff about the thing, and so that seems uh, very ripe for crime and illegal crime. <laughs> so, uh, Ozark, that's on Netflix. Season three just came out. I guess my pick is, uh, I mentioned this in the other podcast, is the book uh, The Wisdom of Crowds by Russell Sirwicky. Uh, I think it's a, a James Sirwicky, sorry. Uh, really good book. Just a really good thing. And, and I think, man, and I, I would try to think of one that it would be a good one about looking understanding data and probabilities, too, because that is my frustration as journalists and people like this who just quite don't grasp a thing. Or they'll get a thing and they'll say, like, well, here's the thing about this thing. You really got to give out this figure. Yes. And then they'll say, and also this, like, yeah, but you didn't, you didn't adjust for that thing too, because you're trying to score political points or whatever, or downplay or upplay or whatever. And, and I'm getting bad information from all sides. Let me make that very clear. And people who are trying to score political scores by taking a thing and saying, look at it this way, but don't look at it this way. So uh, that doesn't go too much into it, but it still is a really good book about like how you try to arrive at the right answers to things. There you go. The wisdom of crowds. Yep. Gentlemen, it's been after. Cool, yeah. Beep, beep, beep. Awesome. Well, uh, we will, uh, here, here's what we'll do just for, for hygiene's sake. We will stop down the stream for about 30 seconds, make sure all the metadata is upset or is, is all right. We'll restart it up here so Brian and Justin can do their happy hour, uh, their happy hour hour. And um, yeah. Uh, and then we'll be back for Cord Killers after that at six o'clock central uh, with Lamar Wilson. I got Lamar Wilson on this week. So oh, right on. That'll be yeah, that'll be good. It's been a while since we talked to Lamar, so uh, it'll be good to catch up with him. All right, uh, we will. Uh, if you're watching live, just stick around thirty seconds. That's all it's gonna be. Okay, bye. See, I was
was blind to the sun by my thunder And now my vision is all in color It's like a